Uh, okay, uh, I'm going to start now. So if you want to do TCTF or the training TTF, uh, we have people helping out in the other room. This one is just going to be Linux privilege escalation. Um, I'm going to talk about that for a little bit, and then I'm going to give everyone a VM. If you want to start downloading the VM, you can, because it might take, it took me like five minutes on my home Wi-Fi. It might be more on the JC Wi-Fi. But it's, go to go.gmu.edu slash linuxpe, and you should be able to download it from Google Drive. And that's the username and password. And that's a virtual machine that you'll know what to do with it after this. So uh, we have a couple competitions coming up. Um, well, before any of them, on September 26th, so next Wednesday, uh, there's going to be another beer sec. So if you're over 21, um, or if you can get into bars, then you can go to Nova Beer Sec, which is just like a networking event for cybersecurity people. That's going to be at Tyson's Beer Garden, so not that far from here. And I'll be there. I was at the last couple. Uh, and then the next competition that we have is Pico CTF. So Pico CTF is actually designed for middle schoolers and high schoolers, but it's designed for middle schoolers and high schoolers who really know what they're doing. So it's not actually that easy. Um, if you've done it from last year, year, you'll know. Because it starts out, there's a lot of challenges, and the first ones are pretty easy, and then it ramps up, and it gets to harder ones. So I would really recommend doing that if you're a beginner and you've never done a CTF before, or if you haven't done that many. Uh, but we can't win anything in that one, so if you're really amazing, I would skip it. And then we have Metropolis, which is in person. It's going to be at UMD, University of Maryland, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. on October 6th. So I think that's Saturday. Um, join the channel if you're interested and say that you're interested, and then we can put you on a team. And it's carpooling, um, so prepare for that. So privilege escalation. If you don't know what that is, that's, um, that's when you have an access, access to a machine, but you don't have enough permissions to do the thing that you want to. So you have to escalate your privileges to something higher. So if you start as a lower level user, a guest, and then you want to be admin or on Linux, if you want to be root, or if you're on a Windows uh, Active Directory environment and you want to be domain admin, then you got to figure out a way to do that. And this is the way to do that when people don't want you to do that. Um, so you can use this, it, sometimes it's a CTF challenge category, it's not that common. I've seen it in like two CTFs that I've played, and I've played a lot of them. Uh, but sometimes it pops up. It's a lot more common in attack defense type CTFs, where they give you a server or a box that you have to hit, and you have to try to figure out what are the vulnerabilities in it, and then you can get in, but you might not be root. So then you have to escalate to being root. Uh, and then also for pen testing in the real world, because I mean, just like in the attack defense CTF, if you have something that you're trying to gain access to and then you're trying to be root, then that applies. Uh, this one is just going to be Linux. Next week, I think next week I'll do Windows privilege escalation. Uh, that one's, I think it's slightly more complicated than the, Win than the Linux one. I think the Linux one is a little bit easier, if you know Linux, at least. Um, so the first thing that I would do if I was on a box, a Linux box, and I wanted to see uh, how I could get elevated privileges, I would run sudo l. So that just lists all the allowed commands for the user that you're running as, and that's going to be useful for some of the methods that we're going to use. So this is just a diagram of, uh, this is not all the, method, the methods that I'm going to mention, but this is just showing that there's a lot of ways that you can do Linux privilege escalation. There's a branch for Windows privilege escalation, and it's even more complicated. Um, but I find this pretty helpful to figure out that there's different like categories. So the first category that we're going to go over is password mining. So you're basically just looking on the system for either plain text or encrypted passwords that are stored on the system. So that doesn't mean stored on disk necessarily. When I say you can check memory for passwords, you can check, um, that means check RAM, so that's volatile. So if someone else is logged in at the same time as you or has logged in before you and their password in plain text is in memory or they have hashes that are in memory or um, they have an, in Linux in this case, if they have an app that's running in, um, and the app stores the passwords in memory, 
then you can go through, capture the memory, and then either try to crack the hash, or if it's in plain text, then you already have the password. There's also easier than memory, um, there's config files. So if you run that command and uh, you try to grip for it, then and you the two greater than sign just directs all the errors to dev null, so it does not it suppresses errors. Um, then you can try to figure out where the passwords are in the config files. Um, history, that's another good one. That was actually the answer to one of the most annoying CTF questions that I didn't get. It was this um, it was this privilege escalation challenge, and I was trying all these complicated things, and it turned out it was just in history. And we saw it, and the password was tomato soup, and we were like, that's not a command. Why is that there? So if you ever see a weird command in history, it might be a password, or anything that looks like a password in history. Just try it out, and that might be the answer to uh, privilege escalation. You can also look in logs, and I would also use the um, grep around in logs, because there's a lot of logs in var log. Uh, but that's where most of them are stored in Linux. So that's, these are the easier ways to do it, besides memory, to find a password on the system. Another really fast but slightly more complicated way to do it is by shell escaping. So you can actually spawn shells from applications that you're running. Um, so if you're in Vim or VI, then you can run this series of commands, set shell equals bin bash, and then if you run this, it's just running whatever you set. So it's running bin bash, or you can say bin sh or whatever else other shells are on there. Um, that's another tip. So you can check the history of other shells uh, if you're doing password mining and you suspect that someone else is not using bash. Um, so that one's pretty useful. I know there were two CTF challenges that I saw that were about Vim and using this technique. You could also just run exclamation point sh and that'll spawn a shell. You can use the FTP command and if you're in that you can just press the exclamation mark and that'll spawn a shell. Sometimes these shells will be root um, or if you're like sometimes they'll give you and you're not just logged in as a regular user you'll be in a restricted shell which means you can only have access to certain commands which are restricted more than the regular user um, and usually in CTF challenges that means you should do one of these. You could also just try to uh, use find for that or awk. So these are all commands, and they all do the same thing. You just scan shells from application. Another slightly more complicated way to do it is through set user IDs. Uh, so normally, when you run a command, the commands are run by you, the user that you're logged in as. But sometimes, when you run a command, it's preset to run as another user. So like if you're running the ping command. It's going to have to open up socket networks, sockets to um, send network connections. And that's probably going to have to run as something more elevated, depending on which user you are. So that might, the ping command might have a set user ID to run as um, root. So if you want to find all the commands that you're allowed to run, so you can use sudo l to see the commands you're allowed to run. And if you see vim under there, then you can just do the vim shell escape. But if you see something a little weird, or if you run this command, and you see the and you try to match up the commands that you're allowed to run and the commands that run as root, and you see some overlap, you might be able to spawn a shell from that, or write to something like a file and then run that file and then use that to spawn a shell. So this is just explanation of what this command is: find slash that's finds from system root because slash is system root, and then looking for the permissions and then four zero 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 that looks for the SUID bit. Um, and then redirecting all the errors, SCD error, that's what the two means, to dev null, which silences them. So then there's also world writable files. So that means files that you can write to, uh, that you probably shouldn't be able to, or everyone can write to. So whereas the set user ID, SUID, finds commands that are executed with different permissions, world writable files are just files that you can write to that might be executed with different permissions. So an example is cron jobs. If a cron job finds um, runs something as root and you can write to it, then you can have a spawn shell. So this is how you try to find all the files that are world writable. In this case, looking for the Python files that are world, world writable, you can replace that with whatever you want, like sh if you're trying to look for shell scripts. So this is the 
more complicated but fun part. Um, you can use cron to spawn shells. So cron schedules tasks to execute at certain times, and the tasks are stored in a file. And so user level tasks are stored in this file path, and system level tasks are stored in this file path. So if you can find something that you can write to or do something with in the system level tasks, that's more important. Um, and that's probably going to get you farther in this case. So the two things that we're going to be going over are overwriting files and wildcard tar injection. Okay, so overwriting files is what I just mentioned. It's um, kind of obvious. It's just it's a file that you overwrite. It could be a Python file, and then you can have it spawn if you write the uh, have it spawn a shell, just or execute arbitrary commands by itself. A wildcard tar injection is more fun. Um, so I did this on the VM the, that I displayed earlier. I just created this two directories and two text files in the test directory under my user. So star in Linux is a, a pattern and it matches everything. It returns, if you have run a command on star, it returns an alphabetically sorted list of file names matching the pattern. Uh, so if you run rm star, it would delete file 1.txt and file 2.txt. But since rm doesn't work on directories without the dash r flag, it would just delete these two files and it would leave the two directories. But the way you mess with commands with the star is, uh, is by making files like this that bash autocompletes into arguments for the command. So in this case, I echoed nothing and I wrote um, dash rf as the file name. So now in ILS, I have the two folders, I have the two text files, and I have this blank file called dash rf. So when I ran rm star before, without the dash rf in the directory, it would just delete the two text files. But what do you think it does now? That is here. There's no way. It's yeah, it does. <laughs> so, that's really, I mean, it doesn't work if you can do that. Not every shell allows you to create it with echo. Usually they won't restrict nano, though. So, um, just a tip if, if you find that um, you're restricted in that. But yeah, if you can create a file named dash something, then it can, when it runs on it with star, it'll interpret it as part of the argument and as part of the command instead of running it on a file. So it won't delete the dash rf. It'll just think you're running rm dash rf, which deletes these two. Is that just a design feature of the bash shell? Yeah. So that's fun. So applying it to, does everyone understand this? Okay, cool. So, applying this to cron and how you can get privileges from it, uh, you can use it with, an example is with tar. Uh, so, if you have a cron job and it's running tar, which that compresses files or it uncompresses them. It archives them or it unarchives them. It's like it zips them um, or it unzips them. So, one of the arguments for it is checkpoint. And if you run the checkpoint argument, it says after tar performs a certain amount, like after it runs on a certain amount of files, it'll do something that you want. Like it'll run a command that you want. So you, that is useful because if you're backing up your web server and you say, okay, after like 100 files, I want you to write to a log or something. Or if you're backing something else up and you want to zip it, but you want to free up disk space by cleaning it up at the same time, you'll say after I have zipped 100 files, uh, delete the files that I just zipped. So that's why that's there, but it can be abused if you find a cron job, like, for example, if you're on a web server and you're just a normal user, but you want to be root, and you've compromised the web server, and you see this in cron, in cron tab, it's running as root, so you have to figure out a way to make this run what you want and spawn a shell. It's running tar, and it's zipping up what's in var www html. So it's zipping up the web server files into html.tgz and you have to figure out a way to spawn a shell when this runs and it's running every minute. So if you apply this and you're trying to 
create a file that goes into the arguments with tar in this case you can run these commands so in this case your so echoing is it is writing to a file so in this case it's writing this to a file and this is being written to test.sh which is a shell script a bash script it's messing with etsy sudoers that file so that controls who's a super user sudo is super user do um, so if you're writing this, you, whatever your username is, equals root, no password at all, that means when you, you're your user and you run bash again, you'll be able to just elevate to root and it won't ask you for a password. If you can write to this sudo or file. Normally you won't be able to, but if you're hijacking this tar command, which already runs as root, then you will be able to. So you write that to a file, test.sh, and now you have to figure out a way to get the system to execute test.sh. So then you write something else in the same file, uh, in the same folder, I mean, and you create this file, dash dash checkpoint action equals exec equals sh test.sh, which means after tar dash dash, you also create this file. So after tar completes one file of the backup of the web server, it'll run test.sh but before it runs test.sh, you create a test.sh as writing to sudoers. So tar runs, it runs as root, it runs your thing that creates uh, no password to get to root, and then you're there. Does everyone understand that? Okay, cool. Uh, and then the one other one, which is, um, I mean, it, it's not that exciting. Uh, unless you found it yourself, but it's a kernel exploit. Some Linux kernels are vulnerable to this. So uh, you can actually look for, if you have a really outdated Linux version, or if you're on a uh, box with an outdated Linux version, then you can run the uname-r to see which one it is, and you can run, there's this tool called Linux Exploit Suggester, and you just run that on the version, and it will tell you if it's vulnerable to any privilege escalation exploits, and you just download them and run them. So it's less manual than the other ones. And if you want to automate any of this, there's actually this script on GitHub. It's a shell script. It checks for a lot of things that I just mentioned. It's called, it's under pentestmonkey unix privesque check. So you can run that shell script, put it on a VM, and it'll try to find these automatically. But I still maintain that it's good to know it, how to do it manually because it might not cover everything and you might not have access to the script all the time. So, all right, cool. if you want to practice what I just said or like have any questions about it, then you can download this. This is a VM which is vulnerable to pretty much everything I said and more um, on go.gmu.edu slash linuxpe. And then the login is user password 321 because that's better than password 123. And you can try to figure out how to get to root. You could, any of these will work. If you don't want to do that, or you're just really confused, you can ask me questions, or you can do the training CTF if you're not really into pr Linux privilege escalation. Yeah, I highly encourage collaboration. Yeah. It schedules and runs tasks. So like if you want to run a backup every day, it'll run that every day. If you want to run a task um, at a later date, it'll do that. So that's why it works, because it's running the backup procedure at a later date as a root, and then you're hijacking it to do what you want. Yeah. Um, this is the more complicated room. Uh, the other room, I think, yeah, um, would be the training CTF. But at this point, you can stay here and answer any questions you have. Yeah, because this is a meeting, so we're doing a fan software here. They're doing the TCTF essentially. Yeah, the training CTF is a good place to start. Um, also, if you haven't read our getting started document, or if you're not on Slack.
We're just going. Like a like a Yeti mic, like a streaming mic. Okay. You know what I mean? We could put it. Here. Yeah. So we could put it here, put it into like whoever's presenting, and then just record your screen for like yeah. the presentation. So it syncs I need with the to. Audio. And we right. can just do that. How do I stop recording? Where is it? All right. Here we go. We got this. This is usually there's. Oh, there it is.